Kawasaki disease is an acute systemic vasculitis seen most commonly in children between 1 and 5 years of age. There is a slight predominance in males and it is seen more commonly in Asian ethnicities, with Japanese children quoted as having an incidence 10 times greater than Caucasian children. In particular, the vessels affected are small to medium-sized arteries, which includes the coronary arteries. This often generates coronary artery aneurysms, which is the most significant manifestation of Kawasaki disease. It is also the most prevalent cause of acquired heart disease in children in developed countries. Despite this, the overall prognosis for patients with Kawasaki disease is excellent following treatment. At present, the exact cause for Kawasaki disease is not clear. The leading hypothesis is an infectious trigger in a genetically predisposed individual. Kawasaki disease is a systemic vasculitis. Therefore, it is thought that the infection moves from the bloodstream to the tissues, where an aberrant immune response in these sites generates the clinical picture. A strange finding in the immune response is IgA plasma cells within the affected tissues. This suggests that there is a switch from B lymphocytes to IgA plasma cells due to stimulation at a mucosal site by an intracellular pathogen such as a virus. We mentioned that coronary arteries are affected, often resulting in aneurysms. Research suggests that this is caused by the release of inflammatory cytokines and enzymes, particularly neutrophil infiltration with mononuclear cell transition that then release matrix metalloproteinases that destroy collagen and elastin fibers. This leads to a weaker structure of the vessel wall and then aneurysm formation. A recent study in Italy has shown a possible correlation between COVID-19 and Kawasaki disease, quoting that the incidence of a Kawasaki-like presentation in their population was 30 times greater since the COVID outbreak compared with the previous five years. The signs and symptoms follow stages. The acute febrile stage lasts around one to two weeks and is characterized by a high fever of at least 5 days. In most instances, this fever is above 39 degrees Celsius. The mnemonic CREAM will also help you to remember the findings in the acute phase and also the criteria for diagnosis that we'll cover later. C is for conjunctivitis, which is a non-suppurative or non-exudative bilateral conjunctivitis and is seen in over 90% of cases. The R is for a rash, usually a polymorphous widespread rash, particularly on the groin and the trunk. E is for edema or erythema of the hands or feet. And A is for adenopathy, meaning cervical lymphadenopathy above 1.5 centimeters in diameter, which may often be unilateral. We then have M for mucosal involvement which can include strawberry tongue, dry fissured lips, or injection, meaning redness, of the pharyngeal or lip mucosa. Myocarditis or pericarditis may also be present in the acute phase. The subacute stage lasts around two to four weeks, at which point the fever, rash, and lymphadenopathy have usually resolved. It's at this stage that the desquamation, meaning a peeling of the skin, starts particularly around the nails. Cardiac abnormalities such as aneurysms most typically develop at this stage, and it is important to remember that the involvement of the coronaries can lead to myocardial infarction and sudden cardiac death. We then have the convalescent stage that lasts between 4 and 8 weeks, and it is in this period that the signs and symptoms of inflammation recede and the acute phase markers normalise. However, cardiac aneurysms may enlarge during this stage. Chronically, it is possible for the aneurysms to resolve, but in some instances, they will persist into adulthood. Overall, Kawasaki disease is a clinical diagnosis. It must include the fever we mentioned, with 4 out of 5 of these clinical findings. And if only 2 or 3 of the criteria are present, then a diagnosis of incomplete or atypical Kawasaki disease is made. 
Lab values may aid in the diagnosis. In fact, the presence of three or more of anemia, a platelet count above 450,000 per microliter after seven days of fever, hypoalbuminemia, elevated alanine aminotransferase, a white blood cell count above 15,000 per microliter, or urine with more than 10 white blood cells per high power field should raise the suspicion of Kawasaki disease. Echocardiography is the main imaging modality involved, and this is mostly done to assess for coronary artery abnormalities. Z-scores are used, which are a way of describing the relationship between a value and a mean for that measurement. In this case, the diameter of the coronary artery compared to the average coronary artery diameter in a child of the same body surface area. The echo is considered positive for coronary abnormalities if there is a z-score of 2.5 or more in the left anterior descending or right coronary arteries, a visible coronary artery aneurysm, or three or more suggestive features such as decreased left ventricular function, mitral regurgitation, pericardial effusion, or a z-score of 2 to 2.5 in the left anterior descending or right coronary arteries. Overall, a z-score of less than 2 is considered normal. 2 to 2.5 is considered as dilatation only, 2.5 to 5 a small aneurysm, 5 to 10 a medium aneurysm, and more than 10 a large or giant aneurysm. This is important because they also have an effect on the treatment. The mainstay of treatment is the administration of intravenous immunoglobulins, which is indicated if the patient is still within 10 days of fever onset, or in cases where they are beyond 10 days of fever, have risk factors such as an ongoing fever or raised inflammatory markers. Aspirin is also often used in conjunction with the IV immunoglobulins. This is one of the few examples where aspirin is used in children due to the link with Ray's syndrome. This is continued typically for at least four to six weeks or longer if the Z-score has not returned to normal. In patients that are not responding to intravenous immunoglobulins, steroids or anti-TNF-alpha agents like infliximab may be used. Longer term, the follow-up depends on the Z-score. For example, Patients with a Z-score below 2 at all times would discontinue aspirin therapy after 4 to 6 weeks and would likely undergo cardiovascular risk assessment at this stage and again at 1 year. In contrast, patients with giant aneurysms are recommended to have aspirin therapy as well as an anticoagulation medication such as warfarin or low molecular weight heparin. They are also recommended to have assessments through several months throughout the first year and every three to six months thereafter, a stress echocardiography every six to 12 months, and consideration for further imaging, such as an angiography during the first year and every one to five years afterwards. They are also recommended to avoid high intensity activities and some patients may need dual antiplatelet therapy in which case clopidogrel will be added to the aspirin. In some high-risk instances, beta blockers may also be started. The treatment is then scaled down according to the regression of the aneurysm. For example, moving from a large or giant aneurysm to a medium size may then warrant the discontinuation of the anticoagulant therapy in exchange for a dual antiplatelet regime, which then may be moved to a single antiplatelet agent once the aneurysm is defined as small.